thousand years, this fragile remnant of humanity slowly built up its numbers. In the Far East, they wandered southwards, driven by the search for game, or fearful of the many active volcanoes scattered along the Asian Ring of Fire. What was it that allowed our species to rebound from this crisis, to expand our population and live longer lives? The answer lies in our ability to view and interpret the world about us. Human consciousness gives us an inner world to occupy. We can think about what we're doing and feeling and about the behavior of others. Our self-awareness is more highly developed than any other species and it is the secret of our success. We can see our place in the social group. We can anticipate the need for food or fuel. As we shuffle and order these thoughts in our minds, we can reflect on the past or project forward into the future. All this leads to strategy the ability to manipulate events, relationships, and the environment to our advantage. Consciousness was the key that opened the door onto new horizons. Over 15,000 years of nomadic wandering, Homo sapiens steadily populated the Eastern world, a journey accomplished in 700 generations. Travelling was made easier by the land bridges that existed 70,000 years ago. Sea levels were 75 metres below what they are today, and much of Southeast Asia formed a single landmass. When they reached the modern-day Indonesian island of Java, they found a perfect land to make their home. A mixture of forest and open woodland, rich volcanic soils, nourished by large rivers. There was plenty of game, with herds of wild cattle. But here, the wandering humans made an extraordinary discovery. In Java, they found evidence of another species, Homo erectus. When first discovered, these skulls were believed to be the remains of some cannibal feast, gruesome bowls of bone for drinking. We now know their shape was caused by water erosion, as the skulls were washed down river from their original resting place. So who were these mysterious people? They were the descendants of an earlier migration. Back in the mists of prehistoric time, a hominid named Homo ergaster journeyed out of Africa. They colonized much of the old world, including Southeast Asia reaching Java an incredible 1.8 million years ago. This was Java man, the classic Homo erectus. His descendants survived here until 100,000 years ago. They were contemporary with our species, Homo sapiens. While we were populating the Earth, they were in their last dying days. They became extinct, but we carried on and filled their place in this tropical world.
Our species has developed a special talent for adaptation, taking advantage of what we see around us. A nomadic lifestyle allowed our ancestors to move successfully between open woodland and equatorial jungle. As they made their way through the tangled foliage of the rainforests, did these early explorers follow existing trails made by forest-dwelling elephants? The vegetation may have looked luxuriant, but the soil was in fact poor and fragile. and there were no herds of grazing herbivores to provide the primary source of protein. Catching the occasional deer was a rare event. The animals of the rainforest were smaller and harder to see. But our great advantage as a species is that we can eat almost anything. We could subsist by foraging for roots and tubers in the soft forest soil. As in most equatorial regions today, these early humans adjusted easily to getting 80% of their sustenance from fruit and vegetables. Experimenting with different plants brought the risk of poison or illness, but it also offered great opportunities. As they explored the forests, they must have noticed one particular plant, a tall tropical grass with hollow jointed stems that would completely change their way of life. This was bamboo. <laughs> Using stone tools, they fashioned this strong, pliable material into spears, containers for food and water, and baskets. Perhaps it was the way vines twist together to give themselves strength that gave these people the idea to weave fibers together to form the rope that became so important in their everyday life. Such lateral and versatile thinking came from our unique capacity for conscious thought. We could imagine in our minds how to translate nature's tried and tested designs into practical structures to suit our needs. By weaving and lashing materials together, our ancestors found they could build simple bridges across gullies and ravines they could put together shelters. These structures offered protection against tropical downpours and a home base for the hunter-gatherers. Here they could make traps and snares to catch birds and other small forest creatures. It was a place to share the haul from the daily foraging. This kind of innovation is the hallmark of our species. Without the ability to invent new skills and tactics for survival, it would have been impossible for Homo sapiens to successfully occupy all the environmental niches on Earth.
In each new place, we had to find nourishing food for our children, so another generation could continue the human journey. There was, however, one environment that would change us and the course of our great odyssey, the seashore. This was by far the most fruitful and provident site for our wandering ancestors. The nutrient-rich coastal waters were a natural home for foraging humans. They stretched for thousands of kilometers along the Southeast Asian landmass. The sheltered lagoons inside the coral reefs were gardens of plenty. The receding tides revealed seaweeds rich in iodine and minerals. They experimented with various techniques for food gathering until one day someone must have tried something that had never been done before. We have no way of knowing how or where they achieved their first forays onto water because of the shortage of fossil and tool evidence. Their use of timber and bamboo instead of stone and bone has left little for us to find. They probably lashed bamboo and mangrove wood together with forest vines to make simple rafts for fishing and plant collecting in shallow lagoons. Mangrove and other hardwoods eventually become waterlogged and sink, but bamboo is naturally veneered in silica that keeps the water out, making it far more buoyant. Carried by tides, they made crossings from island to island. All this prepared them for an epic journey that heralded an astonishing leap forward for Homo sapiens. When they reached the end of the landmass, our ancestors were confronted by open seas. To the south, just over the horizon, lay a vast, unexplored continent. Australia. Perhaps they saw smoke. Plumes just a kilometre high from forest fires in Australia would have been visible across the stretch of water separating the two great lands, a distance of only 90 kilometres. Prompted by curiosity or the search for new resources, they decided to attempt a sea crossing the first in human history. To even contemplate such a venture, they must have had strategy, planning and communication. Building a raft that could carry a sizable group of people meant organizing and assembling the right materials. The people must have had a plan for storing food and water for the voyage. All this means they had an advanced form of language. This historic sea crossing provides us with the first reliable evidence for language among modern humans. For Homo sapiens, this was a major turning point. Whether they knew it or not, their fragile expeditions carried with them the seeds of greatness. From here, they fanned out and occupied much of Southeast Asia. While some sailed northeast towards New Guinea, 
others ventured south. Over thousands of years, successive waves of the human tide landed on the remote shores of northern Australia. Evidence shows they occupied the continent at least 60,000 years ago. The most likely pathways were across the green coastal belts and along the mighty waterways through the dry heart. Within a few thousand years, these people occupied most of the continent, from the tropical northwest to the cool temperate zone in the south. Here, in this far-flung land, we find new signs of a creative and spiritual awareness in the human mind. In southeastern Australia, rows of eroded sand dunes mark the shores of ancient lakes. 50,000 years ago, their waters and foreshore teemed with animals, birds and marine life. One of these is called Lake Mungo. In 1974, a geologist was examining sediments along the ancient shoreline when he saw a telltale white bone sticking out from the sand. It was part of a human skull. He and his colleague worked quickly to expose the fragile remains. They uncovered an entire skeleton, an extraordinary find. A man lying on his side with his hands clasped over his pelvis. His bones were stained pink from red ochre, a reddish clay used for decoration. The mourners must have sprinkled the body with this pigment in some kind of ritual, perhaps with spiritual significance. Mungo Man is the earliest record in the world of this kind of practice. Recent dating suggests he was buried here up to 60,000 years ago. Such an ancient connection with this land is strongly argued by Aboriginal people. We can imagine, so far back in time, that their lives were rich and fruitful. With plentiful supplies of food, they had time to reflect, to create a dreamtime world which they brought to life in a brilliant new way. In Arnhem Land, northern Australia, modern humans tried to make sense of their world by transforming their thoughts into images. Painted on the sandstone walls of a hidden valley is a strange animal. Nothing like it exists today. It's a Palakestes, a giant prehistoric marsupial that's been extinct for around 50,000 years. Could this mother and baby have been painted by the very first people to arrive in Australia? Mud from a fossilised wasp's nest stuck to the rock on top of the artwork may provide a date. This could be the oldest rock art in the world. On another rock face, someone graphically described an emu hunt. 
The artist not only imagined the trajectory of the spear as it was thrown, but the sounds as well. The dotted lines emerging from their mouths represent the cries made by the man as he hurled his weapon and of the emu as it was struck. This is the earliest record of a dynamic painting that includes sound effects. For thousands of years, Arnhem Land people have been coming up into this rock shelter during the wet season to escape the mosquito-infested plains below. The rock's polished surfaces have worn down over countless generations of use. In these lofts and attics of the rocky escarpments, they painted humans and animals in the rich hues of the rust-colored landscape. Were they simply painting what they saw of the world around them, as we might take a photograph? Or did the paintings hold some deeper significance that identified our species and marked them apart? For the first time in our journey, art became central to explaining our place in the world. With our conscious minds, we began to look at ourselves and wonder who we were. And wherever we traveled, we took this desire for self-knowledge with us. 200,000 years ago, our ancestors emerged in Africa. They journeyed north into the Middle East. While some migrated through Southeast Asia to Australia, others followed different pathways north into Europe, Central Asia and Siberia. But wherever they went, they took with them qualities that define our species. Twenty-seven thousand years ago, three people were buried together on a hillside in what is now the Czech Republic. The way they are laid out seems to tell a story. In the middle is an individual of unknown sex. On either side are two young men. One is lying face down. The other has his hand laid across the central figure. What tale does this strange tableau tell? Some have proposed an ill-fated love triangle. Others, an accident that tragically killed three friends. Pieces of fossilized charcoal suggest a fire was lit over the bodies before they were buried. Like Mungo Man in Australia, their bones are ingrained with red ochre. Here, they've added a string of fox teeth. Ochre also covers the pelvis, and a single spearhead rests ominously between the legs of the middle figure. Exactly how they died remains a mystery, but this discovery allows our minds to connect with the past across thousands of years. These cro were hunters of the mighty beasts that ranged across the mist-laden plains connecting Eastern Europe to Asia. But for these humans, the animals were more than simply prey or dangerous predators. They created images of them. This lion is carved into ivory from the tusk of a mammoth. 
hunted down or scavenged, the mammoth supplied many of the Cro-Magnon's needs. The animals are now extinct, and the hunters have long gone, swallowed up in the mists of ancient history. We might imagine their lives were basic and primitive, but the evidence from these valleys and hills tells a very different story. Below this ordinary-looking vineyard, in the village of Dolny Vestanice, lies the hunter's home site. Was this the site of the world's first settled community, 26,000 years ago? Archaeologists have discovered the remain three settlements, including huts made of saplings and clay. There are well-used hearths, storage pits for food, and burial sites. Also found in the earth were curious fragments. 15,000 years before the Japanese invented pottery, the Dolny people made clay figures. These heads of a lion and a bear are no bigger than a fingertip. They are the world's first ceramic. Although they took great pains to capture the likeness, as in the features of this rhinoceros, they deliberately shattered the terracotta figurines in some kind of ritual. And their accidental preservation leads us to a remarkable piece of deduction. Based on clever detective work, Professor Olga Sofa and her colleagues believe these people were also weaving textiles. Now these people were doing an awful lot of things with clay. Now since they're also firing clay, they are practicing extensive pyrotechnology. When you're fooling around with fire, accidents can happen and sometimes these people's houses burn down. When it burns down, whatever is impressed onto clay, the clay gets accidentally fired and you have it preserved forever. Now, see here, if you look very carefully, and if the light strikes it right, is a series of parallel striations, uh, slightly zigzagged, which is indicating warp and weft of a plant fiber-based woven textile, which got impressed onto this piece of clay. It's an accident. Uh, you're wearing a pair of cloth pants. You sit down on slightly wet floor. It's loose, it's clay all over. The floor is slightly wet. Guess what happens? You imprint. Uh, so you have impressions which are accidental. They had a whole suite of fabrics that they were manufacturing and likely used as clothing. We have seams of things that look like bags. These people are using a whipping stitch to put two pieces of cloth together. Uh, this is also when we start getting the oldest needles. Now, if you look at those needles, those beautiful ivory uh, or bone needles, which are very, very fine, 20,000 years ago, some of them are the same size that you carry around with you in your sewing kit. They're very fine, and if you look at them, you realize that there's no way on earth that you would use needle that fine to sew leather or hide. The bone would just break and the ivory would break. Uh, far more logical that this is used to sew textiles, to sew uh, plant-made fiber textiles into things, into bags, into maybe shirts, skirts, whatever it is that they were making at that time. There are no textiles preserved from 25,000 years ago, but these Venus figurines offer supporting evidence. The Venus of Willendorf appears to have a unique kind of headwear, which suggests the use of plaited and woven material. Draped from the waist of the Venus of Les Pugues is what looks like a woven skirt. Far from being primitive, the Cro-Magnons wove clothing with fine bone needles, made pottery, carved ivory, and occupied settled camps. With the people of Dolny Vestanice, we see the onset of a modern existence.
They crafted ornaments and jewelry from shells and pierced animal teeth. They etched intricate patterns on mammoth ivory. This is believed to be a map showing the layout of a village and its surrounding landmarks. What prompted our ancestors around the world to begin to think in pictures and designs? What triggered this amazing change in human consciousness that transformed our existence and elevated it to new heights? By this time, our global population had risen to around 100,000 people. The expansion of their numbers compelled them to become more organized. Food preservation, hunting trips, social and religious events all required planning and discussion. As their lives became more complex, they created new outlets for their thoughts and feelings. But then, 20,000 years ago, the fluctuating Ice Age came crashing down on these newly sophisticated modern humans. Temperatures plummeted. Glaciers and ice caps grew, forcing people to retreat underground. Cro-Magnons entered the caves of prehistoric Europe in search of more than shelter. On the rock walls, they carved patterns of long grooves and notched shapes whose meaning is lost. Others we can recognize as the female body. Procreation and fertility were vital to the survival of these people. The pregnant-looking Venus of Losel carries a ceremonial horn and is tinted with red ochre. She is the oldest engraving of a female figure in the world. drew these people to venture so deep into the caves. In some cases, they traveled two kilometers underground. There's no sense that they were afraid. Often, children accompanied adults or explored this dark underworld on their own with only a fragile flame as a lamp. Here, in the cave at Nio in France, footprints have been found in the soft clay floors dating back 20,000 years. An adult led a child 800 meters into the subterranean depths. There to blow pigment over the child's hand, leaving a negative imprint. Perhaps the caves were special places where shamans could invoke the spirits of the animal world. But if so, these customs involved the whole society. Most likely, they were meeting places where neighboring clans could come together for social and ceremonial purposes. From subtle clues, Archaeologists have pieced together a picture of family groups painting, engraving, or modeling clay animals. 
they worked in creative harmony with children playing around the adults. Evidence shows that the children joined in. Their finger holes have been found in the clay work. These were hallowed chambers where they could all explore the hidden world of meaning and symbols. There are so many mysterious marks and signs. Could these have been the first efforts at writing? Some have a sacred aura that floods the senses as you enter, like the cave at Lascaux in southern France. A cavalcade of animals covers the walls. Painting 17,000 years ago, these artists were at the height of their powers, using the contours and shape of the limestone walls to add dimension and movement to their murals. Each animal is observed with the eye of someone who knows their subject intimately. It is a magical place. Lascaux was painted by the descendants of the Cro-Magnons, called the Magdalenians. Living in Europe between 18,000 and 10,000 years ago, they took cave art to its greatest heights. Much of their painting was done high on the walls and ceilings. From post holes and fragments of wood found in niches in the rock, we know they built timber scaffolding and platforms. The atmosphere would have been smoky, permeated by the smell of burning fat from the tallow lamps. As they painted, the flickering candlelight brought the animals to life. Their paints came from naturally occurring pigments they found on the cave floor or places nearby. Iron oxide, manganese oxide, charcoal and calcite were ground and blended with sand, clay and water to create rich earthy colors. This stone palette and tools found at a site not far from Lascaux shows the range of implements they used for engraving and painting. 15,000 years after the artist put it down, his flint tool still has ochre stuck to its tip. They applied the paints in many ways, using their fingers or with brushes made from tufts of animal hair or vegetable fiber. Tools and animal bones littered sections of the cave. They must have stayed in the caves for periods at a time, eating and probably sleeping there. All this tells us the Magdalenians had a completely modern mind. They were artistic, imaginative, and had a complex spiritual relationship with their environment. The Magdalenians discovered a vibrant relationship between art and life. They decorated their tools and spears. They created delicate and finely honed implements from stone and bone, like these barbed harpoons. They etched intricate designs on animal bones. And they worked with more difficult shapes and materials, like antler horn. From the bones of birds and reindeer, they fashioned musical instruments. 
15,000 years ago, someone played clear, high notes on this piccolo-style flute. They had extensive trading networks. The teeth and shells they used came from up to 500 kilometers away. Such elaborate decorations were not the product of idle whittling. They had symbolic value. Scattered around the bones of these two children are hundreds of tiny shells. Their presence here tells us the Cro-Magnons lived in a structured society. Perhaps these children came from an important family in the tribal hierarchy, their death honored with these ornaments. All this changes the way we see our human ancestors. They achieved this remarkable creative explosion in 50,000 years. From the eruption of Toba, when just a thousand of our ancestors survived the cataclysm, around the world, they came back from the brink of extinction and flourished. They survived and adapted. From a small and concentrated gene pool, they populated the entire globe, from Africa to the Americas. We couldn't be where we are without these people. They were our ancestors. They prepared the way for us. As their journey ended, ours was just beginning.